we have seen uh, how the Carnot engine works or Carnot uh, cycle works. Now we are going to discuss about some other types of engines, uh, some of which are uh, realistic engines. So among them, today we are going to talk about Starling engine, gasol gasoline engine and diesel engine. We know that we have already talked about that the steam engine and uh, Starling engines are um, external combustion engines but as a gasoline engine and diesel engines are internal combustion engines and we know that there are uh, petrol cars and diesel cars right so in in petrol cars uh, typically gasoline engine works and whereas in diesel cars the diesel engine works so we're going to talk about those things today those are realistic engines and we'll see uh, an equivalent ideal version of those realistic engines but we'll start first with starling engine because that is something which is uh, which has very similar efficiency and works in a similar manner as Carnot engine. However, unlike Carnot engine, it is actually a realistic one and we are going to show that today. So here we are showing a force you know, the Starling engine cycle for an ideal system. Assuming that there is uh, no losses due to frictions and any other things, how does uh, this particular um, ideal Starling engine works? So it is very important, you know, interesting to know that the Starling engine came almost eight years before the Carnot engine, you know, around 1816, whereas the Carnot cycle or Carnot proposed <coughs> the Carnot cycle around 1824. So even eight years before that, Starling made uh, a workable engine. Now the reason was that uh, there was a steam engine before. Steam engine came around 1760s, and uh, there was a lot of explosions in the steam engines. So in order to you know, uh, reduce that explosions. He came up with uh, Robert Starling, who is with a priest, came up with this particular design of Starling engine. And uh, it has a lot of advantages. We are going to talk about that today. So, an ideal Starling engine basically has uh, two pistons. So, one is right side piston, another is like left side piston, which is connected through something called regenerator R. One of the pistons is in contact with high temperature heat bath or reservoir and another piston is in the con is in contact with the low temperature reservoir. So it starts with let us say at the point 1 where the there is there is a change in the volume of the right side piston uh, uh, the gas in the right and, and and this is filled up with some gas hydrogen or helium. So in the right side first the compression happens where uh, the volume decreases in an isothermal manner from 1 to 2, it is shown here and during that process heat gets released out of the system and then it comes to the point 2 where now the gas is in contact with the high temperature reservoir. So earlier the gas mostly was in contact with the low temperature reservoir and it got you know shrunk in an isothermal manner releasing the heat and then once it shrunk. In the second step, the gas which is in contact with the high temperature reservoir gets the um, uh, heat from the regenerator which is inside the system, but there is a shrinking of volume on the right hand side and there is an increase in the volume of the left, left hand side piston. So by that there is no change in volume. In the third step which is here this is the power piston where there is an expansion in an isothermal manner from 3 to 4 where you can see that the gas which is in contact with the high temperature reservoir expands whereas the low temperature reservoir it is same there is no change in that. And in the last step there is a decrease in the volume since there is a decrease in this side and increase in this side, the volume remains constant. Now see that in these four steps, in 1 to 2 there is an isothermal compression therefore heat goes out of the system and in 3 to 4 there is an iso isothermal expansion so the system takes heat from outside. However, in the other two steps from 2 to 3 and 4 to 1, this is uh, 2 to 3 is actually a isochoric process. Ideally this isochoric process would require a lot of thermal reservoirs in order for it to be reversible because the temperature is changing at each step of the way. So in order to make it reversible 
it has to be attached to several infinite number of thermal reservoirs at different temperatures. However, an ideal Stirling engine is designed such a way that the 2 to 3 the heat is taken from the regenerator. So, the QR which is taken here that is the heat taken from the regenerator which is this one and in this step the heat is released to the regenerator between 4 to 1 and regenerator is typically a wear mesh uh, and therefore, it can absorb the heat and release the heat. So, this QR uh, the same amount of heat between this 2 to 3 and 3 to 4 is done within the system itself. So, therefore, no heat is taken or given out in this particular two steps. This makes the efficiency of the engine which I am going to talk about is almost uh, you know exactly like Carnot engine because it works within the two temperature um, reservoirs one is the TH and TL and we are going to show that the efficiency becomes exactly like Carnot engine if there is a regenerator here. If there were no regenerator here then what would happen is that the heat has to be taken from outside and therefore, the efficiency will be reduced because then it will no longer be a Carnot engine. So, we are going to calculate the efficiency of the Stirling engine. So, this is a PV diagram, this is an isothermal step, isochoric step, isothermal and isochoric 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, 1 to 2 is an isothermal compression process and we know that in isothermal compression process delta u equal to 0 and q equal to minus w which is nothing but n r t l l n v 2 by v 1. In the 2 to 3 step it is actually a isochoric process. So, in an isochoric process the heat we, we call that first one as q 1 which is the heat that goes out of the system and this is an isochoric process is q r which is C v. So, q r uh, will be uh, C v because it is in constant volume process T h minus T l. 3 to 4 is isothermal expansion again let us call it q 3 oh this is the place where the heat will go in inside the system q 3 equal to n r t h l n v 4 by v 3 and 4 to 1 will be again q r c v t l minus t h. So, you see that in the second to third step the amount of heat is exactly uh, the same as but negative in uh, sign as 4 to 1. So, they will exactly cancel each other if that is taken from within the system itself and regenerator is part of the system itself. So, although we uh, the system uh, takes heat here and rejects heat in this particular step nothing is coming out out of the system. So, if I calculate the efficiency with the regenerator then the total change in heat is q 1 plus q 3 and heat input is coming only in the 3 to 4 step which is q 3 which will be 1 plus 1 plus q 1 by q 3 that means 1 plus now q 1 is n r t l l n v 2 by v 1 q 3 is n r t h l n v 4 by v 3 n r cancels each other 1 plus t l by t h and we know that v 2 equal to v 3 and v 1 equal to v 4. So, therefore, v 2 by v 1 is equal to v 3 by v 4 and therefore, l n v 2 by v 1 equal to l n v 3 by v 4 equal to minus l n v 4 by v 3. So, therefore, there will be so we can we can exactly write that minus l n v 4 by v 3 by l n v 4 by v 3 cancels and we get 1 minus t l by t h. 
So, this is an engine which between you know it works between two temperature reservoir T L and T H and it has exactly same efficiency as that of the Carnot engine. So, this is a realistic example of a Carnot engine uh, which uh, came interestingly even before Carnot proposed the engine itself. Now, you see that if, if this the regenerator would not be there then your efficiency would be that Q 1 plus Q 3 is the total work done divided by the heat input that is there in the Q 3 step plus Q R. Because the, in this step also heat has to be taken in and in this step also and therefore, uh, because uh, uh, the other two uh, heat processes Q 1 and minus Q R will cancel in the numerator and therefore, this will have lesser efficiency let us call it like uh, efficiency of a irreversible Stirling engine which will have lesser efficiency than a reversible Stirling engine. Okay. So, now uh, we are going to show you uh, a realistic Stirling engine which however, has instead of two pistons like this shown here it has only one piston and you know this is the typically Stirling engine model that are sold uh, and uh, we have also one of that uh, with us we are going to show you that. Uh, so, but before we are going to show you that uh, I am going to explain that with the help of a picture. So, the Stirling engine typically has a uh, few important components. So, this is an example of a uh, you know Stirling engine model as you can see there is only one piston here and there is a displacer which is of uh, made of foam which is here inside the whole thing is sealed there is a gas inside this system and you can look at here is that. So, this is the piston that I have drawn one most important thing is two cranks one is here crankshaft and another is here and you can see that they are 90 degree apart right now this is down here just like in this configuration number 1 and this is perpendicular perpendicular to the other one which is like this. I have joined the two in order to denote that that they are connected if this one rotates the other one will also rotate. Right now the volume is some midway as you can see there is small gap between the white colored thing and uh, the bottom there is some gap. So, this is in the midway situation and the displacer is down. Now, what is going to happen is that the Stirling engine works as I said based on temperature differences. The temperature difference can be created by putting hot uh, putting uh, heat uh, or high temperature in the lower plate and low temperature in the high, uh, upper plate or the other way around uh, low temperature and then lower plate and high temperature in the upper plate. So, basically you have to create a temperature difference the temperature difference can be either side. Now, but we have uh, shown here uh, the picture in order to mimic something where the temperature is coming from the bottom. For example, right now the displacer is down and the piston is midway. Now, when once the system gets heated up here I know uh, so, okay. so the, uh, now what will happen is that the most of the gas is in contact with the low temperature. So, therefore, what is going to happen is that it is going to shrink. So, this is the way so you, from your side it is uh, clockwise. So, it is going to shrink so in the second step as you can see here and, and once it shrinks the volume the displacer comes in the middle as you can see in the picture and you can see in my model also. Next step what is going to happen is that now the gas is in contact some of the gas is in contact with the hot plate. So, therefore, it is in a, and it is going to take in the heat and keeping the same volume the pressure is going to increase which will push it further and in the next step the displacer is going to go to the top piston is again going to come in the middle. Now, in this step now most of the gas is in contact with the hot plate. So, therefore, it is going to expand now once it expands you can see the piston has moved up. So, this is the power part of the uh, whole cycle. So, this is an isothermal expansion that is going to happen and which again will move 
So now move, movement of the piston is is actually moving the this particular crankshaft arrangement and this is again connected with the displacer. So, the movement of the piston causes the wheel to rotate which in turn causes the displacer to also change at the same time. So, the displacer is changing because the piston is going up and down that is first important thing and secondly the, the power part of the piston where it actually pushes up and let us say rotate helps uh, the uh, helps to cre create the momentum which in turn goes uh, makes the complete cycle. And we can uh, sh we have shown here that uh, the PV diagram looks like an ellipsoid where 1 to 2 is the step of isothermal compression and then 2 to 3 is like a constant volume process almost and then 3 to 4 the expansion will happen and 4 to 1 is again uh, the constant volume changes, but it is not an ideal engine. So, therefore, it is exactly not like a, a, a not like exactly a constant volume thing. Okay. So, now we are going to show you that uh, we are going to put it on a hot water below and we are going to show you that from your side it is going to rotate in this direction. Okay. So, let us do that. You see uh, from your side the piston is on my side. So, the way we have put it the piston is on my side and in that case it is going to rotate in the clockwise direction. So, before we show you that we are going to also calculate uh, uh, also measure the temperature of the two plates. It is, it is fluctuating between 24, 27 things like that. Let us see the bottom plate. bottom place is already little bit higher 27.3. Now, let us put the hot water, we have hot water here. Temperature of the water is 70.7 degree. Now, going to put the plate, remember I told you the piston will be opposite from your direction and in that case it should rotate clockwise. So, right now this plate is going to get heated up, this is going to be cooler. So, compression is going to happen first and then middle and then expansion will happen. Yeah, it started. It is going to pick up the momentum as the plate gets hotter and hotter. Let it uh, you know be there a little bit time. So, you see unless there will be a this 90 degree arrangement, once this expansion will happen it will just get stopped because in that case uh, all the gas will be in the bottom only and the piston will be expanded form. But just because the piston and the displacer are in a 90 degree shift arrangement. So, I can show you that while this video is playing that in the first stage what is going to happen, what is happening is that. Now, let us say let us look at from this angle. Now, in this angle the piston is in the middle and the displacer in the, the down place. So, this is the place of the displacer, this is the piston place and they are connected together. Now, what is going, what is happening in the next step is that since it is getting cooled down this is the number 1 in the second phase, second step piston gets lower and displacer goes to the middle. So, this is connected to the displacer, this is connected to the piston, this is connected to the displacer, connected to the piston. Now, you see there is a clockwise rotation happens. In the third step, piston again goes to the middle, but displacer now goes to the top and in the last step, now displacer goes to the middle again and piston goes to the top. So, and that is the reason that whenever the piston goes up because of the displacer, it displacer helps the air to be connected to come in contact with the hot and cold air. So, that is a very important part of the displacer. Another important aspect of the displacer is that it absorbs heat and gives away heat during the phase where, uh, where there is a constant volume changes happens. Okay. 
So, now uh, if I change the hot and cold side what is going to happen? So, you see if I start with 1, so right now when the hot side he is here and cold side is here, then it is uh, going on in uh, you know according to this diagram going on in a clockwise manner. Of course, that corresponds to this movement, but let us say this side is colder, let us say this side is colder and that side is hotter. So, what will happen is that if this side is hotter, the upside is hotter, so then it will expand. So, that means from 1 it will directly go to 4. So, when you see once that happens from 1 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, this rotation is in clockwise direction, this one to this one to this one in clockwise direction. But if it goes to goes in opposite direction 1 4, then it will rotate in the other direction. See right now it is this this thing is rotating in a clockwise manner, but if this is colder and this is hotter, then what is going to happen is that next step from 1 it will go to 4, expansion will happen. So, 1 to 4 is an anti clockwise movement for this guy. So, it is going to rotate in the opposite direction. So, right now from your side when the piston is away from you, it is rotating in clockwise, but if I put it in front on top of ice, it is now going to rotate in the anti clockwise direction. So, we are going to show you that and also one important thing is that the if the flywheel is not heavy, then also this rotation will not be possible because you need to have enough momentum for it to go over one cycle. So, there is an expansion phase that happens right that gives uh, a certain rotations of the wheel, but in that if you have enough momentum then you can cross over the, the next part of the uh, cycle and that is why you need uh, some momentum on that. Now, we are going to put it on the ice it is already slowed down. Now, you saw that there was a clockwise, rota clockwise rotation you have seen. Now, you see now it is going to have anti clockwise rotation. I am go going to give you a clockwise rotation just to see whether it happens or not, but it is not happening. So, let us give it an anti clockwise rotation. Let it get cool down because it was the plate was hot. Right now, we have now changed the direction of the temperature. Now, the temperature was flowing from bottom to top. Now, the temperature is going to uh, go from top to bottom, top plate to the bottom plate. <coughs> While it is just getting cooled down, one interesting thing about the Stirling engine is that it does not eject anything unlike steam engine or gas engine and all that. The gas is contained in, in a particular uh, uh, space and it is soundless. However, it does not give enough power because in order to give, get the power that is required for let us say running a car or or on a bigger other bigger machines, it will re require much larger system, much larger engine and therefore, but people are trying to make it uh, better. And another interesting thing is that wherever there is a temperature difference, for example, uh, you know these computers generate a huge heat and all right. So, let us say one can manipulate and, and put a Stirling engine to, to take the ejected heat out of these computers and throw it outside in a, in a cold environment let us say Norway or somewhere wherever the temperature is very cold, but inside it is heat heated up. There one can use that uh, and uh, then you can use Stirling engine to extract more uh, this thing from um, extract work out of that. So, now let us say let us try that anti clockwise direction and you can see it is working in the anti clockwise direction slowly because uh, the temperature difference is not that great. Earlier the temperature difference was 24 to 70, which was almost 46 degree difference, but here the difference is 24 to 0, which is like 24 degree difference. So, larger the difference is, you have seen the efficiency is going to be more and more, uh, depending on the difference of T L and T H, the efficiency is going to change. Now, you see from your direction when the piston is away from you, it is now anti clockwise rotation is happening, whereas in the other case it was happening in a clockwise uh, direction. So, just one more uh, important point that I would like to make is that in the Stirling engine we saw that heat transfer from low to high moves the wheel. That means, heat gives rise to work, but and eventually what will is going to happen is that the, the temperature difference is going to decrease between the two plates 
and efficiency is going to reduce slowly because heat is constantly taking in and leaking out from that unless we maintain the temperature difference going to come to the same. Now I have put it for a long time on top of ice. I am just going to show you the temperature 24.9, no, 25.0 very similar temperature difference and we saw that we will stop in the same manner in which we have put the heat and did the work, we can do the other way around, we can actually do the work and create the temperature difference, it is just opposite of work to heat and heat to work, as we know that right that energy is conserved. So right now if we do that for a long time, I do not know how long we have to really try, if we do that for a long time this is going to create a temperature difference. So right, right now can you tell me like whether the top plate will be hotter or the bottom plate will be hotter. I am moving it in the direction where uh, it is a clockwise manner. Yeah. So if you do that the bottom plate is going to be hotter because that the flow of heat has to be from here to here in order for it to rotate in a clockwise manner, but probably we have to do for a long time. Yeah, so as I said that changing the hot and cold side will lead to the cycle moving in 1, 4, 3, 2 which is currently happening now. Without heavy wheel the momentum will not be enough to go through the contraction phase. So there is an expansion, there is contraction, uh, initial momentum is required. So if you just put it on, on top of. Uh, hot plate or cold plate, we, if you do not touch the engine it will not work. At least you need to give an initial momentum because uh, the situation is like that so you are not, the system is not always kept at 3 such that in the first step itself you will get the expansion to 4. Typically it is, it is, it is uh, somewhere in the middle, so therefore you have to give up it push to at least cross one cycle once. Once it crosses one cycle then for the subsequent cycles the the work that uh, or the heat that is taken in between 3 and 4 will be enough for it to go over the cycle and without the regenerator as I said that efficiency will be less. So this particular engine has lower efficiency compared to the ideal Stirling engine which has uh, which uh, of, of course this, uh, this has lower efficiency for many other reasons because it is a realistic one, it has frictions and it has many other things, it does not have an ideal gas and ideal expansion and all that. So, so a typical engine, a realistic engines will always have lower efficiency than the ideal engine. But the interesting thing is that while uh, Carnot designed this uh, particular highest efficiency engines, Starling already had made or designed an engine which works and that has the same efficiency as that of the Carnot engine. <laughs>